Welcome to the online teaching ministry of Pastor Rob Ginter and Farmdale Baptist Church. For more content, visit us online at farmdalebaptist.com. Recently, uh, I have walked through uh, cancer with my father. And in so doing, we went through, uh, he went through chemo and radiation. And it, in that process, it got all of the cancer, which you want it to, right? But even though that it got all of the cancer, they said, we still want you to have surgery just in case there is a molecule of it that touched something. And in that moment, you realize just how awful that cancer is. That somebody who used to have it, right? They, they, they would still do surgery on somebody who used to have it. Make sure that they don't have it. To make sure that they're not going to have it. And here we, and I say that because in John chapter 7, there is... A cancerous attitude that's growing in all of these people. And it's so serious that it is a rejection of Jesus Christ. And it's so serious that we should look at our own selves to see if it's growing. In ourselves. That's what we need to, to look at from this text. And you might not have looked at it like this before, but the overarching summary of the first 24 verses of John chapter 7 is this that your love for the praise of men is unbelief growing in your heart. Based on this, we see these groups here. Jesus and the Jews, and Jesus' brothers and the Jews. And all of this just looks different, but it's the same type of rejection. So here's what I don't want you to do. I don't want you to read the very first verse and go, what's for lunch? This doesn't apply to me. How so, right? Look at verse 1. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. So after the bread of life discourse, in which Jesus offered himself like bread, and said, you need to take me in, because I give you life. After feeding the 5,000, he barely has a baker's dozen. Doesn't have many at all. After this, verse 7, in verse seven, chapter 7, verse 1, he went out in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea, because the Jews were seeking to kill him. I don't want us to read that and go, that is not the level that I'm at this morning. Right? Like, I'm not, I'm not there. I'm not there in rejection of Jesus to where I desire his death. Again, if possible, right? If there's some way to redo it like that. That's not me. But we see elsewhere in the book of Hebrews, in which he writes to these Christians, and he says, Take heed, brothers, lest there believe be an unbelieving heart in you. It would cause you to fall away from the living God. So believers need to look at their hearts. So I want you to see what this unbelief looks like. Three elements of unbelief here in the text. To see if you have one of the elements of unbelief in your heart to any degree. To any degree. To any degree. So Jesus, and we'll get into the festival of booths more in, later on in the chapter. Or, but here at the beginning, Jesus is there with his brothers at the time of the Jews' feast of booths. So imagine this camp out, mass celebrating camp out. Jesus' brothers come to him. In verse 3, this is where we see what begins. So his brothers said to him, 
leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you're doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. So far, so good, right? Until John commentates on it, or comments on it in verse 5. He could commentate if he wanted, I guess. For not even his brothers believed in him. So this is where you see the first element of unbelief, that your unbelief scoffs at Jesus' claims. Scoffs at Jesus' claims. So the brothers didn't understand what drove Jesus' agenda here. So one of these three main festivals happening, and Jesus was gaining popularity, and then he lost popularity like crazy. And maybe his brothers are like, you're sliding in the polls. You're losing the election. You need to do some political changes to yourself. So let's start with this one. There's a lot of people at this feast. Now, was that a serious statement? No. They're saying this motivated by unbelief. We would only know that if John told us, because otherwise we're like, yeah, that makes sense. No, they, so, so based on verse 1, Jesus is not going. One reason, because people are seeking to kill him. And his brothers go, you should go. You shouldn't listen to your brothers. <laughs> you got one, I guess. <laughs> right? Yeah. I talk to, my, talk to my kids all the time. Don't listen to your brother. Don't listen to your brother. <laughs> Don't listen to your brother. So, if you're, one of, if you're running a public relations campaign, you must relate to the public. So, Jesus' brothers knew that people had stopped following Jesus, so maybe they're playfully trying to do this. But certainly they are scorning or scoffing at the claims he's making. You're a miracle worker. Go show them. Show them. Let them see it. And Jesus says a correction in these verses. That's what he says. He says, my time's not yet come, but your time is always here. So there's something different between me and you. Specifically this. You're talking about the world. It's almost as if he says here in verse 7, it's funny you should say the world, because here's my relationship with the world. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it, that its works are evil. So here in John, the world is in reference to a way of thinking that, that dominates the culture. Right? John uses this to say that, he's not saying in verse 7, that every single person on earth hates Jesus. But he's saying that there is a system that does, that absolutely does, that absolutely does hate Jesus. Why? Because he evaluates the system. And what does he say about this system? you guys doing? It's evil. What you're doing? It's evil. So Jesus goes against the world system. So his brother's like, show yourself to the world. He's like, oh yeah, speaking of the world, we're not on good terms. Go show up and talk to them. You see, I, I could do that, but there's this, uh, we had a bad breakup between me and the world. And if I show up there, it's just going to, it's just going to go bad. And what is the breakup? Adam and Eve. <laughs> Adam and Eve. That's the breakup. Man sinned and rebelled against God. And, they, and he thought that his way of doing things would win the day and prevail and lead to prosperity apart from God. And that was the bad breakup. So therefore, God became a man in the person of Jesus to come down. And this system and everyone who participates therein hates him. Hates him. Why? Because he testifies to it that its works were evil. I think that it was Tim Keller that used this illustration, like if the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, if they do their job, people are going to be upset with it. Mm -hmm. Because they go, pollution, bad. 
and the polluters don't want to be evaluated and they don't want to be managed. So therefore, if they're doing their job, they will face hostility. If they fight pollution, those causing the pollution will be hostile against those fighting the pollution. Makes sense, right? Well, here is the Lord Jesus who evaluates the world system and he says, it is evil. So therefore, those who are participating in that system are going to go against it. Because he's faithful to call balls and strikes on a cosmic level. And he evaluates this world system and he goes against it. And they go against him, and they hate him. So Jesus tells his brothers, you go up to the feast. I'm not going, because my time has not fully come. And this is, this is in context, talking about him making a public entry into the city, which he will do. About halfway through this book, he will go publicly in. And he will go publicly in, and be publicly executed. And he knows it. He knows it right here. A public entry at this point would fast forward the timeline of the sovereign God for which he stands and lives. And he refuses to do so. So, he says to his brothers, you go to the festival, I'm not going to the festival. Why? Because the brothers are right at home in the world. They don't believe in Jesus, they're in the world. They're in the world, they're against Jesus. Go on to the world. Go So, this is, there's enough so far in this text to cause us to examine ourselves in this way. To what extent are we participating in the predominant thought of this world system? Mm -hmm. Is there conflict therein? As one preacher put it, if there is no conflict between you and this world system, you're either not a Christian or you are a coward. <clears throat> and that hit me like a ton of bricks. Because there is a system that everybody thinks is okay. There is a right side of history. There is a trajectory that goes completely against God. Is anybody going against it? That is for God? How are you fitting in so far? How are things going? Now, if there's always conflict between you and everyone, that's another story. That doesn't make you a Christian. That could make you a jerk. <laughs> right? Let's not get crazy here. Like, there has to be some type of conflict between us and the system and the, the predominant thought of the day. Just look at how Jesus relates to it. So, are we chasing the same things they chase? Do we want the outcome of our life to be the outcome of their lives? Do we want the same outcomes? And here's what this would look like, right? So we've seen this. We've seen this on the, on the sliding political parties as they slide. For instance, did you know that politicians change when they stand on issues to win elections? <laughs> Did you know that? Is that new? Is that new? Oh, well, it's true. It's true. They do. They do. Christians stand on God's word and apply it to issues. Amen. See the difference? See the difference between Christians and politicians? And I'm not saying there aren't Christian politicians. Saying Christians stand on the scriptures and apply them to a changing culture. Right. The scriptures don't change, the culture changes. Mm -hmm. So, what's that mean for us in the long run? That means that to be biblical faithful, to be biblically faithful and worldly popular is it cannot coexist long term. Mm -hmm. And will lead to conflict at some point. The church that blushes over controversial parts of the scriptures, the church that blushes over what God calls sin and the culture calls celebration, 
cannot stand before God. We can't stand before God. That's his evaluation of his people in the Old Testament is you don't even know, you, you've lost your ability to blush, right? Over, over your committing of sin. The church can't do that. So like, here's, here's what, the, what that would look like. It's that we should be embarrassed about our sin more than we're embarrassed about what the culture thinks about the scriptures. You see how those two things can't go together? Like, we should have a real problem with our sin. But we won't if we think that our primary goal is public relations. The cry of the genuine Christian is what Peter said in the last chapter. Let it ring in our ears forever and ever that, Lord, we have nowhere else to go. We believe that you have the words of eternal life. Jesus' brothers were the complete opposite. They didn't understand the timetable and goal of Jesus' mission, and they were motivated by unbelief. So he tells them in verse 8, you go to the feast, but I'm not going. And afterwards, he does go into the feast without people noticing him. And when he gets there, we see the unbelief of the Jews beginning in verse 12. And there was much muttering about him among the people, while some said, he's a good man. And others said, no, he is leading the people astray. Yet for, the fear, yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly about him. So you see them there on the fence. Some say he's good, some say he's not, some are, are indifferent. But either way, what your opinion is, it has to stay quiet. And why does your opinion stay quiet? Because public opinion actually goes against him. People with power go against him. So I'm not going to stand for him. So the brothers are like, show it off. John references the Jews are mixed but silent. The fear of the Jews were more that they were the fear of the Jews won the day as opposed to them being firm in their commitments. So it's to this group in the middle of the feast that Jesus does go up, and they're marvel at him, at him half-hearted. And they said, and he has a conversation with them, and they go, how do you speak like that, and you didn't go through our theological schools? How do you teach, and you've never studied? And here's what Jesus says in verse 16. Jesus answered, that my teaching is not mine, but him who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God, or whether I am speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks of his own authority seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. So this is where we see that your unbelief scoffs at Jesus' claims. Is the embarrassment of the brothers? And secondly, your unbelief steals glory. It steals glory from Jesus' identity. So he cuts to the heart of the issue, came down not to entertain the masses, but to do the will of the Father. And what's that look like? It does not look like receiving glory like men give each other. But it looks like deflecting to the Father. The goal of his ministry? To speak under the Father's authority. To seek his glory. That's how you know his word is true, because the benefit is the glory of God. So that's why I said to the extent, right, that we love human approval and the praise of others, it's tied to unbelief growing in our heart. We see the second group doing that. So based on what Jesus said here, the one who gives God the most glory... It's the most true. It's the most true. That's why Jesus is completely different than they were expecting. But yet they rejected him. And why? Because he's already told us why. In John chapter 5, verse 43, he said, I have come in my Father's name, and yet you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. So Jesus comes living a Godward life, and that was a big problem. That was a big problem. That was, that was a big issue. He puts God on display more than he wants human approval. And people will have none of it. This is the reason, or a reason, my friends, that humility, have you ever been around a humble person? Let me tell you about them. They stand out. Because they're not trying to stand out. In the midst of a bunch of people that are trying to stand out. And to make themselves look good. When someone one is humble, they don't do that. So 
it stands out. Humility stands out in our culture because nobody is in that line. So when you go get in that line, most of the time, you're by yourself. But let me tell you who is in front of you in line. The Lord Jesus. You get in line with him when you do that. You get in line with him. So when someone lives to put God on display, even to their own humiliation, it's so strange. So, so strange. What's exactly being rejected here when Jesus does this? Well, he looks at the world system and it hates him because he evaluates the actions. He speaks under his father's authority and seeks his glory and they won't have it. Let me show you what this would look like in your life if you were to do it. You would tell necessary truth even when it embarrasses you. Even when it embarrasses you. Even when you don't look good. You would still say what is true. That's what you would do. I want to make a caveat here. There, there are people who sin with their lips and walk away with some type of confidence. Well, it was true. Yeah. Where I've reached the age where I can say whatever I want. No one reaches that age. No one lives that far. No one lives that long. You don't live that long to not be under the authority of what God says you should do. That's right. This is talking about applying this. looks like someone saying things that are true and necessary even when it's at their own expense. Mm -hmm. Even when it's at their own expense. Someone comes to you. You're selling something. They try to buy it from you. Let me tell you. This is what's wrong with it. I'm not going to take you. This is what's wrong with it. Buy it or not. I might not get as much out of it. I'm going to be honest with you about the quality of this that I'm selling you. Why? Because my integrity is tied to someone else's glory other than my own. So I'm not going to take you. Christians, when they sell things, they shouldn't take people as suckers. Right? Because they should be people of integrity who do what this is, right? We, we're more worried about God getting glory than us. So that's what we do. We do that in our dealings with people, even when it makes us look bad. Why? Because there's someone else we care about looking good, and it's God and his glory. And we don't want to veil it. So that's what we do. So that's why... Our unbelief steals glory and puts it on us. And it's not the right place. We are not the right location for glory. We are the reflector of God's glory. So that's why we get down to the foundation beginning of verses 19 through 24. So your unbelief scoffs at Jesus' claims. It steals glory from Jesus' identity. And not, not only that, but it stands as foundationally on self-righteousness. This has got to get cut out. Anything this touches, anything, any of this self-righteousness has to get cut out. Because of what we see in verse 19. He says, has not Moses given you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? This is the beginning in which the Jesus takes this conversation, verses 19 through 24, to talk to, his, to, to the, this audience who is seeking to kill him because back in John chapter 5, he healed the paralytic and broke the Sabbath at the pool of Bethesda. They wanted to kill him because he broke the Sabbath. So what does Jesus, what's the indictment of them here in verse 19? You have the law, but you don't keep the law. You're trying to kill me. Because you're saying, I didn't keep the law. I fulfilled the law, and you're trying to kill me. So what is exactly is the indictment here? Because this seems kind of choppy, but what is the indictment here? He's saying that they have the law, and they don't keep it themselves, but they are thrusting it on him and using it as a tool to execute him. 
So these are people who have the law, they have God's commands, they don't keep it themselves, but they are going to make sure that you do. That's what he's saying. Law for you, grace for me. That's what it's saying, right? Like they, they wanted and needed grace, but they were flexing the law on the Son of God who came down to fulfill it himself. How ironic is that? But that is what is happening here. Because they cared more about the list of rules that they claimed to keep more than honoring the Father, loving the brother, and accepting his Son. That's what's happening. And what is the corrective that Jesus brings to them that do this? Well, it's in verse 24. Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. So what's the, what's the issue there? There is a judgment that one makes that is very shallow based on things that appear. In, in context, this is talking about Jesus healing the man at the pool of Bethesda. And then just hating him for it. Having the law, hating the son. And Jesus is telling them, don't judge based on what it looks like. Judge with right judgment. So what is right judgment? Well, in context, it is judgment that doesn't think, take things just for what they look like, but goes deeper into what they are like. Not appearances, but realities. Right judgment doesn't deal with appearances. It deals with realities. Because you know, like I know, like we all know, that appearances and realities aren't always the same thing. They're not always the same thing. So what this unbelief looks like in verse 7 is them taking the law neglecting it themselves, placing it on Christ, and thinking that they're righteous in themselves anyway. He says, the reason you're coming after me is the healing on the Sabbath, because you have a surface level understanding of the things of God. You have a surface level understanding. Do you really believe that all God ever wanted was a list of do's and don'ts, and for you to go around policing that in the lives of other people, do you really think that's the life that God wants you to have? Why not? No. How about you go down a little bit deeper? Because what is that? That is unbelief. That's unbelief. Because in the end, they believe they can keep up the appearance of God's standards. You see, that's the issue. The appearance is okay, even if the reality is missing. That is the type of people he's dealing with here. But what about us? How about this? Is it okay to just look holy without acting that way? And I know we all deal with this reality. You're walking down the sidewalk, trip. Look like you started dancing and you didn't mean to. So what do you do? Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> Nobody saw it. We're good. We're good. We're good. You're walking out of your house, yelling at your kids, and you see your neighbor. Hey, how you, how you doing? Get in the van. Right? Like, there, there is this, there's this tension, right? In which that we're like, in it, but we really care what it looks like. Meanwhile, we're not in our house thinking about how we're talking to our kids, what's going on in our hearts. We just get really jacked up when, we, when we're doing it between the van and the car and the neighbors out in the yard. That really bothers us. Does it bother us how we talk to our kids? Not really. What actually bothers us is that the neighbor's out. He's like, what's he doing out there? Get into the house. <laughs> what are you doing out in your yard? What are you, you have a house to live in. Don't live in the yard. That, my friends, is not true belief. But that's what rejection looks like. So I'm, I'm saying this. We're looking down at all these people, and they're rejecting him. Because they don't really believe, they're kind of embarrassed by his claims. They're rejecting him. And they're stealing the glory that belongs to him. They're rejecting him and thinking that they can keep the law. Or, sorry, they can keep what looks like the law. 
And the application for us as Christians who are not under that law is God still wants obedience from His people. Amen. And He put His Spirit in us that changes our life to make it look like what? The law. The law. The Spirit causes us to not want to lie anymore. Or when we do, to immediately feel terrible. Or when we covet. We do so with a sting of, ah, I shouldn't want that. As bad as I want that. The Holy Spirit is in the process. We are, are sanctified. We are being sanctified. So we have been set apart. And He is setting us apart all the more the rest of our lives. Amen. That's what He's doing. So we can't be people who are just worried about looking holy. We have to want to be holy and obedient to the Lord, even if that looks like us being embarrassed because we told the truth about ourselves. I feel like I have to say this. I was going out, in the, out of the house, hollering to get the kids on the way to the van, and I made eye contact with the guy that mowed my yard. Hey, Billy, get in the van. That wasn't, high, that wasn't a hypothetical preacher story. It was me. I did it. And it didn't feel bad until this moment on how I was talking to kids. I felt bad about Billy looking at me two doors down. He's not watching this. He does a decent job. But when we stand before God, and, 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 and right now we are standing before God. Yes. We are right now in the presence of God. Yes. The Christian life is lived in the presence of God. Right. I'm not saying this is just look, the presence of God is here. Oh, it absolutely is. And it's in your car when you go out there too. Mm -hmm. It's in your closet when you're picking up your clothes. It's downstairs. But all of our life is to live, be lived before God. So we have to search our hearts to see if there be this thing in us that is really worried about the appearance and not about the reality. <clears throat> so there's the appearance of things and the reality of things. The reality is, is that we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Amen. We have done that. We have all fallen short of reflecting glory to our, our Maker who made us to put Him on display, to make Him look good, even if it makes us look silly. And that God became a man and a person of the Lord Jesus Christ who didn't just keep up the appearance of holiness. He knew no sin. He knew no sin. None of it was on Him. None of it was in Him. None of it came out of Him. It was foreign. Foreign to Him. He lived the one and only perfect life and He died on the cross for our sin. He died on the cross for our rebellion. He died on the cross for everything we've done against God. And three days later, He rose victorious from the grave. And the grave is empty. And heaven is full. And the church is empowered. And the Spirit is in us. And if you're not a Christian, you need to turn from your sin and make your life solely about the Lord Jesus. So I want to take verse 24 and talk to you for just a second. I'm not talking about being good. I'm not talking about getting better appearances for the bad things you do. I'm not talking about that. Just be better. Do better. Okay. Like it was like it was like the story that the pastor that got the the uh, get better card and he's to the church member and he's like I wasn't sick and he's like I was talking about your sermon just get better anyway I'm not talking about making it look better I'm talking about turning from your sin and making your whole life about the Lord Jesus that is the type of person who looks out and says I don't have it together 
So there's like, there, becoming a Christian, like there's this moment, right? They wish that you look, you look bad because you confess that I don't have it all together. But let me tell you, all the people around you that are pretending to have it all together are liars. They're liars. The room is full of sinners who are pretending to not be. But all our sin has been placed on him. If you're a Christian in this room, every bad thing you've done has been placed on him. And when God looks at you, he no longer sees his sin, your sin. He sees your son, his son. That's the truth, the true reality of the Christian. 